Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to True Crime, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered true crime podcasts. I'm Greg, the host and curator of True Crime. Today's episode is from Reverie True Crime. Reverie True Crime is a narrative-style podcast about unsolved crime cases, missing persons, solved cases, and more from all around the world. If you like today's episode, make sure to check out the episode description for links to subscribe. All right, let's get this show started. Begin. Hello and welcome to Reverie True Crime. I'm your host, Paige. It was on the morning of May 22nd, 1993, when Ricky Nolan McGinn's wife, Janet, left their home in Brownwood, Texas to go on a trip to Arlington, Texas for a weekend bowling tournament. Janet's 12-year-old daughter, Stephanie Ray Flannery, stayed at home with her 36-year-old stepfather, Ricky, who was an unemployed construction worker. Stephanie was in 6th grade at Central 6th School and a B-roll student. She had curly blonde hair and a sweet smile. Her home of Brownwood is in Brown County, an agricultural county with many forested areas, hills, and fields. By Ricky's account of that day, he spent the day fishing and working on his truck with Stephanie tagging along. He and his 12-year-old stepdaughter drank beers together while fishing until she got sick. They went home and Ricky cooked some of the fish. After they had dinner, the little girl fell asleep. Stephanie woke up later that afternoon and went for a walk, but she never came back home. Ricky looked everywhere for her. He told a friend he could not find her, and he finally called the police, reporting Stephanie missing around 9.30 that night. The next day, May 23rd, police went to the McGinn residence with their canines. The search dogs took off to Ricky's Ford Escort, where there were blood spatters and hair all over the back of Ricky's car and in the trunk. There was a blood stain with hair still attached on the back of the driver's seat. Stephanie's bathing suit was in the car, as well as more blood on Ricky's clothes and shoes. Ricky was swiftly arrested and taken to the Brown County Jail in Brownwood and held on $100,000 bail. He was charged with the murder of Stephanie Flannery. His stepdaughter was not Ricky's first, second, or third victim. He was on probation for kidnapping a 27-year-old man and injuring him in 1988. Later, his own biological daughter, Latasha McGinn, would drop a bombshell during her testimony. Sonia Vaughn was a sophomore at Abilene Christian University in April of 1985 when Ricky assaulted her after she rejected him and his sexual advances. On August 1st, 1986, Pamela Adams was threatened by Ricky at knife point, and then he raped her. DNA testing would also later confirm he raped and murdered someone else in 1992, and Ricky was a suspect in another rape and murder case. Stephanie's mother, Janet, was on television, saying there was no way Ricky killed Stephanie as she explained their close relationship. She did not want to believe it at first. Army helicopters, canines, and so many volunteers scoured the area for two days. On May 25th, a state trooper, Gilbert Cappuccina, who worked for the Texas Department of Public Safety, was checking out drainage pipes beneath the roads, and to his shock, at 11.45 a.m., he found Stephanie Flannery's body in one of the drainage pipes. The Tin Horn, as people call them, was not far from the McGinn's home, 
approximately three miles. Her body was sent to the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office for autopsy. The report wasn't released or commented on by officials right away, but eventually it is revealed that the 12-year-old had been badly beaten with the blunt side of an axe, raped, and her skull was fractured. Her cause of death was due to the multiple blows she suffered to the head. That day, District Attorney Lee Haney filed a motion to take away Ricky's five-year probation for the abduction and injury he committed in 1988. He was put on probation for those crimes in 1989, but Lee Haney said Ricky violated his probation by intentionally and knowingly causing Stephanie's death by using alcoholic drinks. He also never paid the money for a required supervisory fee to the district court, which was $40 a month. Stephanie Flannery's murder was very close to the four-year anniversary of junior high student Amanda Goodman's murder, which had still not been solved. Lee Haney stated, quote, It's just a few days from the four-year anniversary of that death. When it's a young person who's been murdered, it certainly reminds you of that. Unfortunately, this is not as unusual as we'd like it to be. From the 23rd to the 26th, the investigation unraveled more of Ricky's criminal past. In 1984, Ricky was tried for the murder of a man 50 miles from Brownwood and Concho County. He was acquitted. The tragic news of Stephanie's death began to circulate quickly. The teachers at Central Sixth School were told to tell their students, around 300 altogether, about her passing. Seven counselors showed up to the school to talk with the children in groups and some by themselves. The principal, Gary Chamberlain, said, quote, there were a lot of tears among staff and students alike. In school, she was a very bright, energetic student, very cheerful and well-liked by the other students. On the 26th, the police searched the McGinn property more, finding what they were sure was the murder weapon. While searching through another truck of Ricky's that was broken down in the yard, Police found an axe covered in blood and hair under the seat. Ricky claimed all the blood was from the fish they caught on May 22nd, but DNA testing quickly confirmed that he was lying and the blood was Stephanie's. Also, semen and pubic hair found on Stephanie's body and in her underwear was sent off for DNA testing. All of it came back as a match to Ricky. On June 10th, 1993, a grand jury would hear the case of Ricky McGinn, see the evidence and the charges against him. He was indicted the next day and remained in the Brown County Correctional Center with his bail being set at $1 million. Ricky was arraigned on June 28th and pleaded innocent to the capital murder charges against him. He was held without bond. Ricky's pretrial hearing was scheduled for August 30th. Due to pretrial publicity, Ricky and his defense team attempted to get the capital murder trial moved out of Brown County. However, in March of 1994, that was denied by the judge. On April 17, 1994, Ricky's second court-appointed attorney, Bob Spence, was driving on a road that went to the Brady Lake. Bob was driving too fast and missed a curve in the road. His 4x4 truck flipped end over end three times, and he was ejected from the vehicle. This was a horrible tragedy, and as much as people did not want to discuss it, 
The ugly truth was, the trial had to go on at some point, and Ricky would need another attorney. A continuance was granted on June 21st of 94, as Ricky's new court-appointed attorney, Ben Doyle Sutterth, had to get caught up to speed and prepare. He was Ricky's third attorney. The first was Pete Gomez, who stepped down from being Ricky's lawyer. The trial was scheduled to happen in the springtime of 1995. Wednesday, May 17, 1995, 38-year-old Ricky McGinn was walked into court to sit before the jury of eight men and four women nearly two years to the day that Stephanie had been discovered. We all know how tight security is in courts today, but back in 1995, it was newsworthy that this man was so despised, extra security measures were put into place. Newspapers were reporting that one deputy checked everyone in the court with a metal detector, and another looked through everyone's bags and purses before they were allowed in the courtroom. As Lee Haney gave his opening statement, he included all the DNA evidence that had been positively linked back to Ricky McGinn. The blood in the back of Ricky's Ford Escort, blood on an axe discovered in his Dodge truck, inside of the home were a pair of Ricky's white tennis shoes with blood on them, and semen and pubic hair belonging to Ricky, being found in the child's vagina. The jury was told the results of Stephanie's autopsy and how the little girl was alone with her stepfather after her mother left for the weekend. They also heard that Ricky called a friend of his around 8.30 on the grim night of May 22nd to tell him Stephanie had left the home around 5 that evening and disappeared. The jury listened as Lee Haney told them that Ricky took his friend on a wild goose chase looking for Stephanie as a cover-up, calling the police when she was not found. The Brown County Sheriff's Department, with the Brownwood React Volunteer Search Team, canvassed the area with tracking dogs from Dallas, Texas, and the canines alerted to Ricky's car. The state had anywhere between 30 and almost 80 witnesses who were willing to testify. Ricky's lawyer told the jury, quote, I don't know how that blood got in the car or who's responsible for it being there, but you don't know and Mr. Haney doesn't know either. He also said that the hair of Stephanie being in the family car should not come as a shock to anyone, and he argued that the blood and hair taken from the axe did not prove to be Stephanie's, and the axe had not been found in the truck during the first search. Quote, Ricky McGinn said he's never seen the axe, and the state has not shown you anything that proves otherwise. He also said that Ricky's fingerprints were not found on the axe. The judge placed a gag order over the trial that was so strict, the Standard Times newspaper was denied their request by the Brown County Sheriff's Department simply for a picture of Ricky McGinn. Deputies were called to the stand by the state, and they talked about responding to the missing child report and organizing the search for Stephanie. The jury also heard from the state trooper who found the little girl's body, along with the Justice of the Peace who pronounced her deceased and ordered the autopsy. Ricky's defense attorney met every witness he cross-examined with a statement about Ricky not going down without a fight. He was extremely pointed with all of his questions and combative. While cross-examining a deputy, asking him why they did not find Stephanie during their first search, 
he began citing the reports that were filed by the deputy in charge that said the search team covered every ditch and culvert in the area around the McGinn's house. The deputy's reply was that Ricky told them Stephanie never crossed the highway, so they did not include the vicinity east of the McGinn's home across Highway 183 initially. The defense attorney fired back, quote, You came in this courtroom today and are now saying that you did not search east of 183 because Ricky McGinn told us not to? Then, while cross-examining the state trooper, he asked if Ricky would have physically been able to put Stephanie, who was 5'3 and 100 pounds, into the culvert, implying that someone who was able to do that would have to have the capability to fully use their arms, back, and legs to carry the child and put a lot of physical effort into putting her where she was found. Ricky walked with a limp, and the defense was out to convince the jury that Ricky could not have put the child in the culvert because he was not physically capable. On May 22, 1995, it had been two years since Stephanie's death, and her mother, Janet, who had divorced Ricky, took the stand as one of the state's witnesses. Janet spoke about where they worked when they were together and how, at the time, Ricky was not working due to being injured where he had previously worked. Janet said before Stephanie was murdered, she and her at-the-time husband had been drinking alcohol more than they ever had. The jury heard from a Texas Ranger who assisted investigators with the case and the criminologist who walked through the process of the analyzation of blood and hair samples, as well as confirming the DNA belonged to Ricky. More physical evidence and test results would be shown to the jury the next day, and it wouldn't be a day without conflict between the prosecutor and defense attorney. Ricky's attorney wanted to show the jury the criminal records of Stephanie's uncle Joe Bob Talley and two other witnesses testifying, Steve and Stanley Saros. While the jury was out of the courtroom, it was discussed with the judge. One of the Saros's criminal records consisted of charges that were drug-related and DUIs. In one of Steve Saros's court appearances, he had been represented by Ricky's defense attorney. Joe Bob's criminal record showed that in 1979, he had been charged with aggravated assault, but it was taken off his record after he agreed to get psychiatric treatment. Then there was Steve Ray Flannery, Stephanie's biological father, who had a criminal history. All of these records were objected to by the prosecutor, saying of Stephanie's father's criminal record, quote, If this criminal record is relevant, then there are other criminal records that we might bring up. The judge ruled that the jury would not be permitted to see any of those records. The jury came back into the courtroom, and Stanley Saros told them he was at the house with Ricky around four that afternoon. Ricky told him that Stephanie had drank too much, and she was in her room sick. Stanley said Ricky seemed to have been drunk. Stanley's son, Steve, told the jury he had been close with the family for five years in May of 93. He testified that even though Ricky had been injured, he was still doing a lot of the heavy lifting and chores while at home, poking holes in the defense's argument that Ricky was so disabled he could not have carried Stephanie or put her into the culvert. In a surprise twist, Ricky McGinn would take the stand on May 31st. He was cocky, but at times he seemed to be holding back tears as he testified.
You're listening to an episode of Reverie True Crime on True Crime by Indie Drop-In. We're going to take a quick break. And now back to this episode of Reverie True Crime. It was reported in the Abilene Reporter News that Ricky talked about the last time he saw his stepdaughter on the 22nd of May. He said, quote, She went walking. She headed off toward the tank. As he talked, he seemed to be emotional. He recounted the day's events according to him. Ricky said he tinkered around with his truck that day while Stephanie swam. Ricky said later Stephanie rode with him to the store and he bought them a couple of beers before going fishing at a pond on their property. After drinking a six-pack, he said his stepdaughter had gotten sick and went for a walk. Then came the cross-examination by the prosecutor. Ricky's past conviction from 1989 for aggravated kidnapping was brought up, and he admitted he did that. With no emotion, he explained to the jury that he and another man had a rope and tied a third man to a tree. Ricky said the man tied to the tree was beaten by the other man, but he said he did not participate in the beating. Ricky's attorney asked him if it was true the man that was beaten had sent a letter not too long ago while Ricky was locked up wishing him well, and Ricky said yes he did. As the prosecutor pressed the issue of sexually abusing Stephanie, Ricky kept denying it. The prosecutor grabbed a picture of the child, making Ricky look at it, and he seemed to get very emotional. Evidence was brought before the jury about other victims who survived, who I mentioned previously, as well as his own biological daughter, Latasha McGinn, Latasha said on the stand that her father sexually assaulted her in 1987 when she was three or four years old. Latasha said he made threats to kill her and her mother, Emma Jean Bible, if she ever said a word to anyone. A couple of years later, when Imogen tried to stop Ricky from visiting Latasha by himself, he threatened to beat her until she was dead. The defense's witnesses included a few friends and family members of Ricky's who told the jury about an odd and mysterious tan-colored van, while some said it was a truck, being driven by a man with reddish-blonde hair. They all testified that this strange character had been driving around the area frequently around the time Stephanie disappeared, as well as making horrible remarks to children. One of Ricky's friends testified that Ricky's mother called them, asking her and her partner to come over to pray about something with her and her son. Once she and her partner arrived at the home, Ricky's mother began to tell them about the mystery man in the van. They prayed about it, and the witness told Mrs. McGinn to write out the details and give it to investigators. The defense attorney also told the jury he would be showing them evidence of how investigators mishandled the case. Quote, You will see a videotape showing handprints on the side of that culvert. Handprints that are too small to be of Ricky McGinn and too large to be of Stephanie Flannery. Those are items that were obviously not pursued. He went on to say that Ricky was arrested as swiftly as he was because there were four unsolved murders at the time in Brown County and authorities were under extreme pressure to solve this case. A forensics consultant from Fort Worth, Texas, testified for the defense, saying, quote, I don't believe that I can either include or exclude Ricky McGinn from the group of people who could have donated the hair. My first opinion was, 
that the questioned hair does show characteristics of being a Caucasian pubic hair. I did compare it with the known sample of pubic hair from Stephanie Flannery, and she is excluded from being the donor. The forensics consultant also said he compared about 20 characteristics before coming to his final conclusion. Ricky's brother, sister, and mother all testified and talked about the videotape of the culvert showing the bloody handprint not investigated. On cross-examination, everyone had conflicting stories about when the video was filmed. The prosecutor also told the jury the videotape could have been made after the discovery of the little girl. The defense brought physicians to the stand who testified about Ricky's injuries, still pushing their argument that Ricky was physically unable to commit a murder in such a fashion. None of the physicians could actually say Ricky could or could not have committed the murder. Monday, June 5th, 1995, before Ricky's innocence or guilt was decided by the jury, the prosecutor told them it would take courage to look a killer in the eyes and say, You're guilty. He also said, quote, Don't you expect an innocent man to look you in the eye and say, No, I did not do this terrible thing. Did he ever say that he was so injured that he could not pick up that axe and repeatedly strike Stephanie in the head? He lifted the axe over his head and brought it back down in a chopping motion. By 6.30 that evening, after deliberating for six hours, the jury had come to their decision. Their verdict being Ricky McGinn was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of sexually assaulting and intentionally killing 12-year-old Stephanie Flannery with an axe on May 22, 1993. Ricky had no reaction to being convicted of capital murder, but his family held each other and cried. On June 7th, it was to be determined if Ricky McGinn would be executed for this gruesome crime. The prosecutor told the jury, quote, The most reliable predictor of someone's future behavior is their past behavior. This man will continue to be a threat to society as long as there is breath in his body. Society has a right to defend itself, and that's why we have a death penalty. At what point did he make a conscious decision to get this axe? How close do you have to get to someone? He had to make a conscious decision to raise the axe and strike her, not once, not three, but four times. He took the horrible crime scene photo of little Stephanie and showed the jury, saying, quote, Look at her face, the terror on it, as she raises up her hand here in a frantic, futile gesture of self-defense. What do you think she was saying? She was saying, stop. Help me stop this man. The defense asked the jury for a sentence of life instead. Quote, he'll be 73 years old before he's even eligible for parole. The society in which this man would be living would be such that he would not be a threat to anyone. The jury only took an hour and five minutes to decide that Ricky McGinn should be put to death by lethal injection for what he did. Ricky's mother was adamant that her son did not kill Stephanie and they would be appealing. The rest of Ricky's family said they could not believe it and there was no proof that he committed the crime. Stephanie's mother, Janet, told reporters that justice had been served. She believed she could finally put her little girl to rest and that Ricky would never hurt anyone ever again. In January of 1998, 
Ricky McGinn's appeal was denied and the death penalty was upheld. In February of 1999, again his death sentence appeal was denied. In May of 2000, Ricky's defense team successfully argued that advancements in technology warranted a more accurate testing of the evidence in the case. The defense team said new testing may not change a thing, but with the improved technology, their client might have a chance to be exonerated. They said it was not only important for closure, but also for justice to be done. Attorney Lee Haney said, quote, What I'm concerned with is the law, and he has been found guilty by a jury. This is certainly not going to prove his innocence. He still killed that girl. Ricky McGinn was scheduled to be put to death on June 1st of 2000, but his attorneys were still pressing to get new DNA tests done. At the time, George W. Bush was the governor of Texas, and during his time as governor, there were more prisoners executed than on any other governor of Texas's watch before him. He did support the new DNA testing, saying, quote, I don't believe we've executed a single innocent person. If the DNA testing helps to settle a case or erase any doubts or concerns, we would support that. Ricky's appellate attorney said, quote, You don't get a chance to do it later. All we're asking for is the time to get the testing done. The state does not even have to pay for it. George W. Bush was running for president at the time and granted a 30-day reprieve for the new DNA tests. Lee Haney said of course he would respect the governor's wishes and cooperate to get the testing done. The afternoon of June 1st, it was still planned for Ricky to be put to death. He was taken to a holding cell where the death chamber was. And while two correction officers watched, he talked to the prison chaplain. At four that afternoon, he ate what was supposed to be his last meal, a double cheeseburger, french fries, and a brownie with a Dr. Pepper. Around the same time he was sent back to the holding cell, the state's decision was being made on the DNA testing. Two hours later, he got the news that a 30-day reprieve was granted. Ricky's attorney said the process and delay was cruel and unusual punishment for his client. An hour before they got the news, his attorney said, quote, I've got a client 30 feet away from the death chamber, and all I can tell him is no one's made a decision. You can imagine how he feels. The governor was not allowed by law to give a second 30-day stay for a prisoner, even if the DNA testing took more than 30 days to be finished. The state and the defense were both working hard to make sure there would not be an execution date set in stone before the DNA test results came back. After Ricky got the news that he was granted the 30 extra days, he spoke to his mother on the phone, repeatedly saying he was fine and that he loved her. Twelve days later, it was reported that the retesting did not prove that Ricky Nolan McGinn was innocent. Stephanie's father's attorney said, quote, If it is true, then it would simply confirm what we knew all along that Ricky McGinn is a cold-blooded murderer and rapist. Hopefully, it's getting to a point of closure now. The attorney went on to slam George W. Bush for, quote, playing politics with this situation to prove to America that he's a fair man, but he picked the wrong case to do that. He said it was ridiculous to put Stephanie's family through this all over again after seven years. An execution date could not be made until the DNA had been retested by both sides. 
The year before, in 1999, DNA tests also confirmed that Ricky McGinn had raped and beaten Christy Jo Egger to death, with his DNA matching semen found in the victim's body. Christy Jo Egger was 19 years old and the daughter of Randy and Gertrude Egger. She was intellectually disabled. She was kidnapped and murdered and found in a cemetery in Brownwood on November 26, 1992. Investigators also believed that Ricky was behind the murder of another Brownwood 12-year-old, Sherry Newman, who was killed in 1989. Mitochondrial DNA testing was underway to find out if the semen found during the child's autopsy was a match to Ricky. He was still maintaining his innocence, however, saying before the results came back, he had all of his things packed and ready to go home because he was that confident the results would clear him. Ricky said when the results came back, it blew him out of the water. He said he was grateful for the 30-day reprieve, but of George W. Bush allowing executions to still happen, he said, quote, I mean, I still don't like the man. I think he gets off on killing people. He just does it through the state of Texas, and he can get by with it. I think he enjoys it. I still want the world to know I'm not guilty. I don't care what the tests show. Somebody else put that there. Referring to the evidence found during the investigation. Whether I leave here alive or in a box, it's going to be better. There's no doubt about that. I believe I'm going to heaven. His mother, Frances, still would not accept that her son was guilty. Quote, I do want to say that DNA is not the only side to this case. The rest of it has never been brought out. I know he's innocent. I brought him into this world. You can call it a mother's intuition. A lot of people agreed that his mother was in denial, as she also told reporters... Quote, the question is, how did that murder weapon get in the pickup? How did the body get in the culvert, and when and by whom? Because Ricky was in jail, so now he's to be executed for all these things, all of which is impossible. There were Ricky McGinn supporters who believed the family had credible evidence to support their claims. However, most people thought the family was simply in denial. On Wednesday, September 27, 2000, 43-year-old Ricky Nolan McGinn ate his actual last meal in Huntsville, Texas. He had chicken fried steak with white gravy, french fries with white gravy, lots of salt and pepper, sweet iced tea, and a glass of fruit punch. He was put to death for murdering Stephanie Flannery and pronounced dead at 6.23 that evening. His last words to his family were, quote, Mama, Adam, Mike, Sonny, Michelle, y'all know I love you. Tell everybody I said hi and that I love them and I will see them on the other side. I now just pray that if there is anything against me, that God takes me home. I don't want nobody to be mad at nobody. I don't want nobody to be bitter. Keep clean hearts and I will see y'all on the other side. Ricky never did say a word about Stephanie or her family. Stephanie's stepmother, Livia, said, quote, Right now, I'm kind of mad because he's not taking any accountability for Stephanie's murder. Now he claims he's found religion. He claims the DNA was planted. He's playing with the emotions of the victims. At least show some kind of remorse. An hour or so before Ricky was put to death, 
Stephanie's mother, Janet, told Dan Rather on 60 Minutes about seeing her daughter's killer get executed. Quote, I'm not afraid, but I'm not excited. What that man did to my daughter, he deserves a lot worse than what he's getting. He lies down and goes to sleep. My daughter was hit in the back of the head three times with an axe until her eye was knocked out of the socket. That's hurting. He's not going to hurt. He's going to lay down in a bed. They're putting a needle in his arm, and he's going to go to sleep. That's awful simple. Ricky was the 667th person to be executed in the United States since 1976, the 232nd person executed in Texas, and the 502nd person executed by lethal injection. And that's the case of Ricky McGinn and the murder and rape of Stephanie Flannery. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please stay safe and take care. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In Network. If you would like to nominate a true crime podcast to be featured, just send me a tweet at Indie Drop-In. I'd also love to hear if one of our featured podcasts is now your favorite show. Indie Drop-In survives off ad revenue and listener donations. If you would like to contribute, please consider buying me a coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Indie Drop-In. If you look at the very bottom of the episode description, I put a link in there to make it really easy. Indie Drop-In has many other shows that you also might like. Just go to IndieDropIn.com. All right, see you next week.